To understand how well the nation protects victims of employment discrimination, the Center for Public Integrity analyzed eight years of complaint data from the EEOC, as well as its state and local counterparts. It reviewed hundreds of court cases. What emerged is a picture of a system that routinely fails workers. Complaint data obtained from the EEOC for fiscal years 2010 through 2020 shows that the agency closes most cases without concluding whether discrimination occurred. Sometimes workers' lawyers say an EEOC investigation involves no more than asking the employer for a response. Employees who bring workplace discrimination charges to the EEOC have to navigate an organization that is chronically understaffed and underfunded. When the EEOC was created under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it was initially given few tools to enforce the law. Its weakness was by design. The system's weaknesses disproportionately hurt black workers. Just over one quarter of all EEOC complaints came from black employees alleging racial discrimination. More and more workplace discrimination cases are closed before they're even investigated. The EEOC, in short, can't come close to fulfilling the mission Congress gave it more than 50 years ago. The agency was a Civil Rights Act attempt to eradicate job discrimination from a nation plagued with it, but it never had the money and support to do it. And that is why trial lawyers like Anthony Ofadili, principal at Ofadili and Associates, have been able to successfully navigate the legal system and represent those left behind by the sheer inability of the EEOC to bring justice to discriminated workers. Anthony Ofadili has has traveled a long road to bring justice to the common people in America. He grew up in a small village in eastern Nigeria with eight siblings and no running water. Most villagers were farmers growing crops such as yams. For water, young Anthony traveled as far as eight miles round trip each morning, carrying a bucket on his head, of course, for his family. He would then take the family's sheep to pasture before heading to school. Anthony's siblings took advantage of Nigeria's then free education and went to college. Anthony graduated in the top two of his class at the University of Nigeria where he stayed on for law school. Eventually earning his law degree from New York's Columbia Law School, he specializes in civil rights and employment discrimination cases. Today, the insider-exclusive TV series meets famed New York-based employment discrimination lawyer Anthony Ofadeli, principal at Ofadeli & Associates, to discuss how he successfully represented several employees at the New York Department of Buildings when they were wrongfully discriminated against and retaliated against by their supervisors in racial employment discrimination, New York City. Anthony has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in New York City and in New York. He has seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims of the big corporations. He understands that racial and employment discrimination is one of the most serious, enduring, and divisive human rights violations in the United States. The problem is not just in New York, but nationwide, and its nature is institutionalized. And because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. His goals, not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure all Americans have the right to a fair trial and fair judges with no agendas. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from New York. It is my great pleasure to introduce Anthony Ofadile to the show. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your type of practice. I do primarily uh, civil rights and employment discrimination cases. Um, I represent mostly the indigent, the poor, uh, the incarcerated uh, who have no voice. and. Um, I try to be that voice for them 
and uh, in employment discrimination cases too, people who have lost their jobs, who have no money, who are looking for justice. I try to be that voice for them to, to try to get them that justice if their case so deserves it. This is a tough practice to pursue justice on behalf of the, the folks that nobody seems to care about almost, right? But you do this because you're originally from Nigeria, right? You know how horrible sometimes living in these countries can be and justice is not even there. So is that your motivation to represent these people? Is that where this comes from? Well, uh, I've growing up, even in Nigeria, the, the, the person who has no voice has always been the person I want to represent most. So, and um, coming here and having the opportunity to practice, I basically continued what I had started in Nigeria and uh, trying to work in an area I believe I'll be most useful and also which for me will be most gratifying and satisfying. Anthony, today we're here discussing another case that you had, which was Gary McCalla and a number of other people. Tell our audience a little bit about the facts of this case. Well, this is a case of uh, employment discrimination where uh, my clients, there were 10 of them, initially wanted to bring a class action on behalf of uh, themselves and uh, others similarly situated in the Department of Buildings. These were inspectors and uh, in the Department of Buildings. Uh, and um, the, the reason for the action was that they were not being promoted and that uh, they, there was a person that they alleged primarily was responsible for the policy of not promoting them, Thomas Connors, and that some of them, like Mr. Dozenville, had worked for the Department of Buildings for almost 30 years. He has a, a, a degree in engineering, he has a master's, and uh, the upper management will go out and uh, bring uh, white uh, men and women and promote them over them. In fact, many of the people who were promoted over them were promoted within two or three years after coming in. They had not even taken the civil service exams. They were not even civil servants. And what happened was that my clients trained them. After they finished training them, then they are promoted over them. Uh, so this was a, a case where we are alleging that uh, the discrimination was based on race and color for not promoting them. Now, in these cases, they're difficult to prove because um, there are many black employees that work at the Department of Buildings, correct? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a very difficult case because uh, the Department of Buildings, most of the inspectors were black. And uh, what happened was that uh, in the 80s and 90s, most of the white inspectors left for better jobs in, in, the, in the private sector. Uh, the black employees, most of them stayed. Um, but uh, in the, from around 2010, uh, to keep employees, the city started increasing the pay. So the pay became uh, what I would call uh, a middle class pay is that somebody can survive on. And what happened was that because there were so many black employees um, and many of the, some of them were promoted, it was difficult to show that uh, my clients and a lot of other blacks were not promoted because of race. So that was the difficulty of the case. And also uh, in failure to promote cases, the standard of proof is really, really high you have to show that the resume of the person who is alleging that he or she was not promoted because of race is so much better that no reasonable person will pick the other person promoted. And uh, the people who were in charge of this discrimination understood the law. They went out and got very experienced uh, white people into and uh, hired them into the city. 
So it was difficult to show that their resumes were not com uh, competitive. So that was the difficulty we have in improving this in, in, in this case. Okay, but you had a very interesting, unique uh, advantage here, and that is the fact that there were three supervisors, heads of departments at the Department of Buildings, that provided you direct evidence of what you were alleging, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, uh, this is a, a unique case, as you said. Uh, I've been doing employment discrimination for some, you know, 25 years plus now, and it's rare to find an, inside, an insider who has direct knowledge and information, who is willing to divulge that information. So in this case, we had, for example, Gary McCalla and uh, Rainville Dozenville, we had their supervisor, the head of the department, um, who actually he left the job rather than be part of uh, what was going on or testify for the city. He, he retired to be able to freely testify on behalf of my clients. So uh, he was able to testify that he recommended uh, these two people, their inspectors in the electrical department that they were more qualified than the white people who were brought in and promoted over them. That, in fact, they didn't even know how to read plans. Um, he was willing to testify to that so that important work, uh, especially in large buildings that involve the safety of the, build, uh, of the public, he didn't send them. He sent these people who were promoted. He sent uh, Gary McCullough and Envy Dozenbill, who now, who are still uh, uh, inspectors to do those jobs. Now, uh, as a result, you won the case. Well, I, I, the case settled, you know, so, so yeah, it settled the week before trial. Probably the reason they settled is because of this evidence you had of the supervisors willing to come forward and testify in court, right? The, that is primarily the reason the case settled. But I also understand that while the case was pending, the discriminatory practices uh, were stopped. Is that right? Yes. After we filed the lawsuit, especially initially when we were seeking class certification, uh, they stopped promotions. That is, nobody was promoted during that time. Uh, eventually, when we decided to proceed with uh, the case of the 10 plaintiffs, who we are the named plaintiffs, um, they started promoting. In fact, they promoted some of the plaintiffs while the case was going on and promoted so many other black people during the interim that you know, uh, uh, trying to make our case difficult, I would say, because uh, with all this, some of the plaintiffs already promoted a lot of more black people being promoted. Um, why, why are we alleging discrimination? These same white supervisor, white managers are promoting them, and we are saying they are dis discriminating against them. So that was a tactic, I believe, that was used to try to undermine our claim, our case. Yeah, let's talk about some of the issues that folks need to know about if they're being discriminated against um, at work. What if you're not sure, what, what are some of the signs that you need to be aware of so that you can possibly bring a case against your employers. Discrimination takes many forms. Takes many forms. You know, it can be discrimination in pay, discrimination in promotion, discrimination in getting over time, uh, discrimination uh, in even getting leave or the time to be out. So, um, the best way of showing discriminate discrimination is having a comparator. Um, somebody who is of a different race or color who was treated better in the same type of circumstance. Um, so, uh, or who was paid more, you are doing the same job, somebody was getting paid more um, for doing the same thing. Or uh, in terms of races, which was very common, especially uh, the case we just discussed in my color case, and in some of the cases I'm doing now. Um, you have a uh, a black man or other minority who has been in the same job uh, for 10, 15 years, on a yearly basis, he may be getting 2 or 3% raise. You have a white person doing the same job who may get 12 or 13% raise, sometimes 15% raise doing the same job. 
And uh, with the fact that many times, within a short time, the white person may end up making more than the person with a long experience. So uh, finding out that information is important, which in the private sector is very difficult. But in a place like the city of New York, because they are public employees, the pay information is public. So uh, somebody that has such access may be able to show what is going on. Let's give some advice to somebody who thinks they have been, they are being discriminated against, let's say in pay or position or whatever. Um, the tendency might be to go to HR, right, and file a complaint. But what do you see happen a lot when you file a complaint in the company that you're working at? Well, um, HR is supposed to be independent, but in 99% of the cases, the people you are complaining against or are complaining about are the people who hire and pay the HR people. So uh, basically, you are, com you are complaining to uh, a, a, a junior officer against a senior officer. So in most cases, it doesn't go well. And uh, what happens is that uh, uh, corporations and employers have perfected ways to terminate somebody legitimately. So once you are targeted, you know, the, 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 it's almost like the, uh, what you hear in the police case is saying, uh, uh, stop resisting, stop resisting. It's the same phrase in employment cases, you know. So uh, my long and short of it is that it's probably better to consult a lawyer first before you go to HR. Consult yeah. a lawyer. Yeah. Because you'll be retaliated again. Yes, retaliation, you know. You are not supposed to do that, but it's common. There are some protected classes in employment, what are they? Well, uh, and what does that mean, protected classes? You see, the general rule in employment cases that uh, it's a master, it's based on the common law, it's master servant relationship, which means that the master can terminate the servant for any reason or no reason whatsoever at any time. So the protected classes depends on the state and the law. Federal law, uh, for example, protects race, national origin, uh, race, uh, I mean, I, I spoke race or disability, uh, sex, and to some extent, sexual orientation. Uh, as, uh, city law, for example, New York City law is more expensive too. So, uh, so protected classes are people, for example, somebody may be black, may be Hispanic, may be Asian, may be um, Arabic. Uh, somebody who may have a disability, somebody who may be bisexual, for example, under city law. Um, so those are protected people. And then, of course, age is protected as well. There's a lot of law firms in New York City. Um, what makes your law firm different than other law firms? We offer knowledge-based personalized service to the client. Um, um, because uh, employment discrimination is uh, a major bedrock of our practice. We keep abreast with developments in the law. And um, my principle when I started this business is that lack of money can never be a reason I turn a client away. If I believe in the case, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll spend the money to get justice for the client and that's primarily the reason that clients don't pay me i pay them even in, an, in cases like civil rights and employment discrimination we have sometimes some lawyers who ask for 25 30 thousand dollars deposit or more or want to work on an hourly basis most clients can afford that well i want to thank you for the good work you do and i want to thank you for being on the show and congratulations on this case thank you Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.